Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tina Wilson. I'm chairperson of the Charles County Board of Education. I'd like to welcome you to the virtual redistricting meeting or public forum for middle schools here in Charles County. I will now call this meeting to order and we will uh, begin by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I will now turn it over to Dr. Navarro, Superintendent of Schools. But before I hand it over to Dr. Navarro, I would like to acknowledge on this call is Vice Chairperson uh, Virginia McGraw, board member, Michael Lucas. Good evening. Board member, Liz Brown. I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone, so thank you for joining us. And now at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Navarro. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Wilson and board members uh, and community at large. Thank you for joining us this evening on our town hall discussion regarding the middle school redistricting plan. Uh, with me this evening to present to the community and the public is Steve Andritz and Brad Snow, who will go through the presentation in detail. Um, we are very happy to see community members uh, logging in and being participants. Uh, I would just ask that if you have comments and questions, if you could please make sure that you put them on the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we will go through and go through your comments, your questions, and address them. We will also be taking all this information and uh, putting it together and adding it to our existing um, FAQ. Um, I just, before I talk, I pass it over to Steve, I do want to acknowledge that uh, board member David Hancock has also joined the meeting. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to, I believe, Steve to get us started. Thank you. Yes, good evening, everyone. Bear with me a second while I start sharing my screen. Okay. We are here, as was mentioned by Dr. Navarro, for the Comprehensive Middle School Redistricting. Uh, this is the second town hall meeting on the superintendent's recommendations for Proposal A for school year 22-23. Uh, you see in the forefront a rendering of Benjamin Stoddard as will be completed with the uh, three-story addition in the front and then the other space is renovated. Benjamin Stoddard Middle School is receiving a renovation addition that is just over $48 million construction project. The school is going to increase in square footage from 105,800 square feet to 148,317 square feet. The state rated capacity, or also known to as SRC, is going to increase from 711 students to 975 students. It is a phased while occupied construction that will complete in the fall of 2020. Two. As was mentioned a little bit ago, the three-story addition that you see on the screen below is actually complete and occupied by the school to this school. But the complete project will not be until next fall, and the redistricting coincides with that. As the redistricting committee uh, began, the superintendent's charge, the committee is charged with creating two alternatives that will establish new middle school boundaries. This is a comprehensive middle school redistricting with a focus on redrawing an expanded attendance zone for Benjamin Stoddard, which is receiving a complete renovation and expansion scheduled for completion for the start of school year 22-23. Board policy 1900 establishes procedures for redistricting. Our goal is to move some students among all middle schools with due consideration of state rated capacities or SRCs and anticipated growth using target enrollment provided by school and county government staffs. Our general guidelines, as we're moving through the redistricting process, committees were informed that all neighborhoods were eligible for redistricting, except those that were currently designated as non-transport or walking zones. Whenever possible, neighborhoods should not be divided between different schools. Account for current and future residential development when meeting enrollment targets. And as we mentioned earlier, that information was provided by county government um, staff. 
consult with transportation representatives regarding the possible effects to existing bus routes when moving students. And when proposing changes to existing school zones, move students farthest from their current school to another school whose current attendance boundaries border the existing school. Those are our general guidelines. One other comment we should make while we're here is the enrollment numbers that were used during the redistricting process were actually the official numbers from September 30th of 2019 as was the case for Charles County and every jurisdiction in Maryland, as well as many across the country, the pandemic impacted enrollments for 2020. So best available information to be used was the official September 30, 2019 enrollment. Just one other clarification. Give you a little bit of background on the timeline and how the committee has moved uh, through the process. October in 2020, the redistricting committee was selected. Public information through a town hall session held October 26th virtually. November 2020, the redistricting committee began meeting weekly. Our meetings were paused due to the COVID-19 pandemic as the process is, is fairly intimate and we needed to meet in two groups. May 2021, the committee resumed its weekly meetings. July 2021, the redistricting committee completed its work. August 2021, the board received a report on the committee's recommendations, August 10th. Public hearings were held on Monday, August 23rd, 2021 from 6 to 8. That was a virtual meeting. And Tuesday, August 24th, 2021 from 6.30 to 8.30. That was a live meeting at La Plata High School. September 2021, the public hearing conducted on Tuesday, September 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. via Zoom. Superintendent presented a recommendation to the board at its September 14th board meeting. Public hearings on the recommendations were set for Monday, September 27th from 6.30 to 8.30 at Westlake High School. So that was last evening. And then this evening, September 28th, 2021, 6 to 8 p.m. virtually. In October of 2021, the board will take action. The redistricting decision will take effect at the start of the 2022-2023 school year. The redistricting committee, as was mentioned uh, a minute ago by Mr. Snow, was selected at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting. There were 11 parents selected through random drawing to serve on the committee. There were two from the elementary schools, one from a high school, and one from each of the eight existing middle schools. Additionally, the Board of Education selected three community at large members for the committee and four school principals. Important to note that the school principals were not middle school principals. They were either elementary, high school, or from the alternative school. The staff that supported were from Charles County Public Schools and from the local government. Uh, as was mentioned, Charles County government, as well as the town of La Plata, folks from their planning offices or planning work management offices came and supported the redistricting efforts by providing information on residential growth that was either existing and occurring now or to be occurring and generating students within the next five years. The superintendent recommended alternative A at the September board meeting. The points of alternative A are a better balance of growth in the growth areas of St. Charles and the large project of Heritage Green, mostly located in the town of La Plata, but also in Charles County, between Benjamin Stoddard Middle School and Milton Summers Middle School. The alternative A plan has better use of the added capacity at Benjamin Stoddard Middle School, as was mentioned, they're gonna increase their state rated capacity from 711 to 975. And we do have a section of the existing building that's being saved for future use. Middle school enrollment in the development district is at or near state rated capacity for future middle school nine. This is an important factor for time when we will be requesting to get funding from the state and we need justification of adjacent schools to meet that need. Additionally, Plan A moves less existing students. We have here is a quick map of the entire county as it exists now, showing all of the middle schools and their enrollment zones. This is an overview map of all of Alternative A with all of the middle schools shown. Alternative A moves 992 existing students. Important to note that these are existing students they are not any of the students that would be coming in through future growth, and they may not actually be moving from one middle school to the other. However, they may be elementary school students that are being promoted and will go to a different middle school than they would have originally. That is that 992 number. 
So I'll start off by moving through the different uh, changes that we're going to see under the Alternative A proposal. Just a quick point of reference, as you see these maps, you'll see different puzzle style pieces with numbers attached to them. Those are the blocks. Each of those blocks have a certain number of students uh, from the 2019 enrollment uh, for grade levels that would be looking at for the re redistricting. Also within those blocks, <clears throat> There are various neighborhoods and different densities and things of that nature. So when the committees are looking at moving students, they're looking at the numbers of students within the blocks and also the projected growth that's occurring in those blocks of those numbers that were provided to us by county and town governments. So this Davis zone, the changes for alternative A, you'll see in green, moving in a block, 3842 from Madawoman, and a block from Henson, 3861. Those blocks would be moving into Hen to Davis. Um, the state rate capacity for the SRC for Davis is 997. The official enrollment in 2019, 885. The projected two-year growth under alternative A would be 934. And in 25, 26, we would be looking at 950 students for Davis under alternative A. The second slide that you'll see just simply shows you the block outlines and then the entire outline of the new Davis zone. Brad, I think it's also important to note that uh, as we encourage the public and they continue to use the interactive maps, the block numbers that you see on the screens and in the presentations are all visible in the interactive map, as well as the number of students in them as you look at the different layers and, and toggle through those maps. And the final map is just providing clarity for the roadways, the major roadways that are underneath uh, the blocks without the block lines. Next, we have John Hansen Middle School. Uh, you will notice that there are areas in red. Those are indicating areas that are moving out of John Hansen zone. We have moving out to Stoddard and moving out to Summers. And then we do have one green area coming in from Stoddard. The state rated capacity of John Hansen Middle School is 797. The September 30th, 2019 official enrollment was 893. Alternative A has John Hansen opening in school year 22-23 at 805 students, and then increasing to 833 in school year 25-26. This map shows the entire zone, new zone, as proposed under alternative A for John Hansen with the enrollment blocks, and the zone with the road network underlaid for ease of use. For the Hansen zone, for the changes that the committee recommended for alternative A, You'll see that they've removed one block and removed that to Davis, and they have brought in a number of blocks from Summers uh, to create the Henson zone. The state rated capacity for Henson, 668. The official enrollment, 930-19, was 811. The school year 22-23 projected growth would be 654, and for year 25-26 would be 666. The second map, you'll see the continuous outline. Um, indicating the blocks that make up that Henson zone. And then the third map, of course, is without the block numbers, and you can see the roads underlay. Next, we have Mattawoman Middle School. Mattawoman has one block in the upper middle section of your screen moving out to Davis, shown in red. The state rated capacity of Mattawoman is 912 students. Their official September 30th, 2019 enrollment was 1,026 students. And alternative A has them opening in school year 22-23 at 915 students and increasing to 943 for school year 25-26. This is the Madelman zone shown in its entirety with the enrollment blocks and the Madelman zone with the road network underlay. Waxon zone represented below for the changes for alternative A. You'll see the state rated capacity of 563. The official enrollment is 450. With the changes taking place under alternative A, the school year 22-23 would see 551 students. The projected growth in 25-26 would be at 570 students. You can see the northern part of the Pickawaxin zone have brought in uh, blocks from Summers to make up that entire Pickawaxin zone. The second um, map, you'll see all the block numbers um, that make up the entire Pickawaxin zone. And then the third, we'll see all the roadway underlays. That's alternative A for Pickawaxin. Next, we have General Smallwood Middle School. You'll notice that there are areas along the right side of the map that are in green moving in from Milton Summers and the outline of the zone in the dark bold. 
State rate of capacity for General Smallwood is 604. The official September 30th, 2019 enrollment was 527. And Alternative A has General Smallwood opening in school year 22-23 at 555 students and increasing to 561 students in school year 25-26. This is the General Smallwood zone with all of the blocks shown in the entire zone. And this is the General Smallwood zone shown without the blocks to show the road network. The new summer zone under Alternative A, you'll see a lot of blocks moving out, the red labeled to Smallwood, Henson, Pickawaxen, and to Stoddard. And then you'll see incoming blocks uh, from Hanson and from Stoddard to make up the summer zone. The state rated capacity, 2019, 795. The official enrollment, 1,086. The projected growth for 22-23 would be at 686. In school year 25-26, uh, we would see 860 students. The next map will show you the entire new zone for summers under alternative A, and then the last, certainly just the roadways. The final middle school is Benjamin Stoddart Middle School. Uh, as was mentioned, you'll see areas in green that are moving in. You have areas along the left-hand side of the zone that are moving in from John Hansen, and then to the, to the lower section moving in from Milton Summers. And then you have areas in red moving out to Summers and out to John Hansen. State rated capacity is shown with an asterisk. That's because a state rated capacity is not officially determined until after the school is open. But this is the projected number and this is the design number that was put forward and we are confident that will be the number. Additionally, that is the number that the redistricting committees used when they were developing their zones and how many students to put in the school. The current state rated capacity, as mentioned, is 711. Their official September 30, 2019 enrollment was 814 students. And alternative A has Benjamin Sodert opening in school year 22-23 at 986 students and then increasing to 1,019 students in school year 25-26. This is the Benjamin Stoddard zone proposed for alternative A with the enrollment block shown and the Benjamin Stoddard zone with the road network underlay. Next, we have a chart that is just a quick reference chart listing all the middle schools in the columns as you uh, are along the left side of the page. As you move to the next column, it is the state rated capacity. The next column as you move to the right is the official September 30th enrollment. The next column is the proposed uh, number of students for school year 22-23 for each of the schools. And the final column to the right is the proposed number of students under alternative A for each of the middle schools for school year 25-26. Additional resources that you'll find on uh, the redistricting process can be found at the CCBOE website by clicking on the link there. You can explore the interactive map for Alternative A. As Mr. Andritz was saying earlier, you can certainly click on any of the underlay um, layers that'll provide you student counts, it'll provide you the zones uh, for the schools and also all of the, um, the block numbers that are associated with those schools. You can zoom in and see where your address points are, your streets, or you can put your address in itself and it'll take you directly to that location. Feel free to email comments at redistrict.ccboe.com. One other point to mention, as this is the fourth public hearing that has been in the public process, there have been a number of comments that have come through through prior meetings. And a lot of those were summarized and responses provided. And all of that information is also available on the redistricting page. Looking at what's next as far as the redistricting process, next month, 2021, the board will take action. The redistricting decision takes effect at the start of the 22-23 school year. At this time, I'll pass it back to Dr. Navarro. Thank you, Brad. I just want to also um, just make a note that uh, board member Ms. Battle Lockhart has um, has joined us as well. Um, we have, a, I think, one question as I've been following the chat um, regarding uh, the explanation uh, for Stoddard. Shelly, do you want to summarize that question? I think we can probably take it for option A. Sure, the question um, in the chat is in regards to zone 2643. 
three, it's zoned to go to Benjamin Stoddart. Um, the commenter is just sharing that the map shows it's in close proximity to um, Summers Middle School. And the comment, commenter is just emphasizing that there are other zones in closer proximity to Benjamin Stoddart, for instance, um, zone 2711 or block 2641. Um, there's just con concern about moving the, the kids further away from their homes. Uh, I can uh, work on part of that answer. That is block 2643 as well as the surrounding blocks are part of the high growth area that is St. Charles neighborhoods and part of the plan unit development and the docket 90 agreement that Lennar and St. Charles have to build out. Uh, and they are working their way south towards La Plata and building those homes. So some of those Southern zones that are closer to um, Milton Summers don't have any students in them yet because there aren't any units built there. But part of the proposal A plan moves some of those high growth areas out of Milton Summers into Benjamin Stoddard as a way to better balance growth because there is still a bunch of growth that is occurring in St. Charles, as well as significant growth that is going to occur in St. Excuse me, in the town of La Plata with the Heritage Green project. So part of Plan A's uh, ba uh, benefit is the balance of those high growth areas. Steve, did you want to mention the moratorium that had been in place uh, since 2016 as well? Sure. Uh, there was a moratorium put in place in 2016 by the former superintendent, and it was put there due to the amount of students that were coming out of those neighborhoods and going to Milton Summers and the issues that Milton Summers was becoming so significantly overcrowded. So the moratorium basically put a time date stamp on when houses got their use and occupancies. And I believe the date was July 15th of 2016. So that any homes in that neighborhood, or there actually were four total blocks around there, any of them that got their use and occupancies after that July 15th date, those people would then zone to go to Benjamin Stoddard. There are a number of neighborhoods there that have been potentially taking students to Stoddard and to Summers, and part of this redistricting will take that away and permanently assign those in those neighborhoods one school. So, Mr. Andritz, I'm going to jump over a question here that I'll come back to. Um, that's in regards to I think the particular area that you're talking about, and a commenter is just saying that. You know, they were told, some of the homeowners were told that before they bought the homes that they were zoned for summers, and they feel like there's an issue with whoever made the plans and the homes um, that were being built in that area. I don't know how or who they were told by, and I, I can't address that, obviously. Um, school zones are always subject to change. Board policy 1900 establishes the rules that the board uses when they do redistricting. And uh, as was mentioned before, part of this redistricting effort is not just about additional capacity that exists at Benjamin Stoddard with the expansion renovation, but it is also about balancing the enrollment because we do have several of the middle schools that have significant overcrowding. And so this effort needed to be undertaken to adjust those zones and do our best to balance those schools. Okay, I have another question here. Um, someone is referencing the 2025-2026 projections, and they're indicating that they're over the state allowances. And the question is, what are these projections based on, and how will those be addressed? So the projections, as you see, do include the existing students, but they also include growth factors. So if there were existing neighborhoods that are continuing to develop and are going to continue to generate additional students, those students are factored in in those time frames. Those, those time frames were determined by staff in county government, planning and growth management, as well as from the town of Plata planners as to how quickly those units are actually going to start to generate students and then applying the student yield factors from the county. So the numbers are higher as a result of those growth factors. The, additionally, the state rated capacity number is not a stop point where you cannot put more students in that in it. It is just the way that the state accounts for how many uh, students fit based on the number of classrooms and a formula 
based on the number of students per classroom that they assume. Okay, thank you. There's a question in here for a parent um, about asking for clarification on her child's zone changing from one school to another. So while we're going through a few of the other questions, I'll post the website link in the chat so that um, attendees can go and use that interactive map and enter in their address and, and see some confirmation on the zones. Um, there's a parent asking about a, a Madam Woman to Davis um, school zone change that I can address. So there's a, another parent asking how they request a, um, how do they contest to the Board of Education to not send their child to a specific school? So there's a process in place that students can request to be placed at a different school that would go through student services. Just to add to that, it is a change of school request and it is on our website. Um, and there is a superintendent rule delineating the conditions by which a change of school request is um, is requested and the process and the appeal process also that follows when uh, such process or such request may be denied. There's a question in regards to transportation and will more buses be necessary to accommodate the distance changes? If so, with the current bus driver shortage, what is the plan to increase driver avail availability now while simultaneously preparing for driver needs for next year? So we're working with our contracted uh, contractors currently, trying to initiate some communications with them regarding certification of drivers to try to speed up that process. Also working with the MBA, um, actually, and the governor of Maryland has also initiated a response uh, this past weekend, having a, um, a driver um, collection for uh, MBAs across the state where people could register and go and take their driver's exam to try to expedite the process. Currently, we are looking at months uh, behind as far as getting drivers in to get their CDL and to take their class, uh, get their endorsements that are associated with bus driver certification. We don't anticipate um, the need to purchase any uh, new equipment regarding um, the transportation of the students to their new zone schools uh, moving forward. But obviously, as, as, we're, as we're dealing with the driver shortage, as, with, as is uh, counties across the country, it's, it's going to be an issue currently, and we're doing everything that we can uh, now to try to address those issues and make sure that all kids are transported safely to school. Uh, we have increased our presence on our own website to direct folks uh, that are interested through um, one of the banners on our CCPS website that takes them to our transportation page that can put them in immediate contact with one of our associated bus contractors. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mm -hmm. There's a question and um, there's a couple, you know, some conversation in the chat in regards to the um, Summers versus Stoddard Zone in the Glen Eagles neighborhood. There's a question in specific to when moving students from Milton Summers to Benjamin Stoddard, will you move everyone from the projected area or will you take only a certain number of students from that area? And I believe that's in reference to the Glen Eagles neighborhood. Anyone who is shown in that block to move from Summers to Stoddard will move to that, will move from Summers to Stoddard. Okay, is there a block within Glen Eagles of students that are only um, being sent to Stoddard? There's a, a person asking, um, they're saying the surrounding areas are still going to Summers. It looks as if the townhouses are the only homes being moved to Stoddard and to please explain that if possible. Uh, all of the units that are in that block 2643, which is, I believe, Glen Eagle South, and I believe there's a mix of singles and towns in there, but that whole neighborhood is being. Okay, there's another question in regards to something shared in the presentation. The presentation mentioned phases. What are the phases for the student moves? And this person is saying phases imply a small incremental changes over time. This seems like the student moves are all happening at once. The phases that were mentioned are for Benjamin Stoddard Middle School, which is a phase while occupied construction. That is a term that's commonly used when you work on a building that still has the students or occupants in it. So the phases there are the phases of construction that need to be complete before you can finish the project. As I mentioned, 
we built the new addition, the three-story addition out in front of the building so that we could then move the, move the students into those new spaces and then start working on renovating existing spaces in the building. That's all part of the phased while occupied construction. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Another question in the chat, what is the long-term plan for the growing Lennar community that is moving closer to La Plata that doesn't have students yet? Will there be another rezoning? Those determinations fall to the superintendent and to the board ultimately. Uh, we will have to create a new zone in the future when we are moving forward with building middle school number nine. The board policy has been for the last several years that all redistricting should be effective a year before a school is to open, such to give the public adequate time to be aware of the changes. So there will be a change that would have to be made to at least create a zone for middle school number nine. Whether it impacts more than just that is really something that would be discussed between the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. There's a commenter in the chat who's um, sharing that their children had to change schools during the last round of elementary redistricting and they're being affected by the middle school changes as well. This commenter is saying last time there was almost no effort made to improve continuity for the kids and it was challenging. Are there any plans to organize meet and greets before the current school year ends so that they can at least try to connect with other families next summer? So the question is about meet and greets for the new schools that the students are going to be assigned to or these students that are being removed from a school and then placed at another middle school? That's how I'm interpreting the question, Mr. Snow, yes. I know in the past when we did redistricting, we did do that at the school level. We had a meet and greet evening for all new income, specifically for incoming students that were new to our zone and that were taking, that were taking on board as a result of the redistricting process. So I can speak from my own experience at the high school level that was done. And I would assume that that will continue across the board as it was done at the elementary levels as well. And that is best practice, so that will continue as well. The other comment to be made, uh, the first part I think of your comment, Shelley, was that the person commented that their students were moved mm -hmm. earlier at elementary. The board policy states that students do not get moved more than once in a three year period and it's per level. So. If they were moved at elementary, this is middle school redistricting and the school system has not done any middle school redistricting since 2000. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Um, there's another question. What is the likelihood that Dr. Navarro will stay the same, her recommendation will stay the same or change, and what is the exact date in October for the decision? The board meeting is, I believe, October 12th. Um, and the board will take up Dr. Navarro's decision of alternative A. The board has the right uh, to make modifications if they so choose. There's another question in the chat or a comment. Residents of Quailwood in Jamestown asked board members to come look at the Quailwood and Jamestown neighborhoods. Did anyone go and visit to see how they are merged in reality. I'm scrolling through. This person lives in Quailwood. The child's bus stop is in Jamestown, so even now the precedent is set by the county that merges the neighborhoods. There, there have been comments in the past with questions on Quailwood and Jamestown. Railwood and Jamestown are two different neighborhoods. They do have connecting streets. There actually is even a third neighborhood, uh, I believe called Hawthorne Green. So there are actually three neighborhoods that are correct, connected by that street network. Uh, but there are significant differences in the neighborhoods. Hawthorne Green is a active adult community with 55 and older residents, so they would not have students. Uh, but there was, there was look at how that works and there was significant discussion with transportation about how picking up of students and bus routing may happen. And Brad, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Where the bus stops are located right now is just simply a convenience issue. It's not necessarily dependent upon someone's address based on what neighborhood they live in. Um, I also believe that Quailwood and Jamestown, the, the creation of those two neighborhoods was a number of years apart. I don't believe that they were built 
Steve, at, around the same time. I believe Jamestown's a much younger neighborhood than Quailwood. You are correct. There's a question in the chat in regards to the middle school redistricting process and why can't students who would be in eighth grade next school year remain in the current school instead of changing to a new school? One of the one of our concerns that we would have would be, you know, obviously um, would be double busing. If we're taking a, a bus into a certain neighborhood to grab some students, take them to a certain middle school, we'd have a bus doubling back um, on, over that same pathway to get students for another building. So it would be double busing would be an issue for us in transportation of moving students uh, to multiple buildings. Additionally, there's a concern that if you don't move all the students, you're not providing all the needed relief to the overcrowded schools. Thank you both. Um, will schools change for students who are currently in special education programs? Special education programs are generally regionalized programs. And if a student is outside of their zone, but assigned to a certain school because of a regionalized program, as long as the regionalized program is not moving, they would stay assigned to that school. But there are other there are other people who can probably answer that a little better than me if somebody else wants to jump. No, that's correct. Uh, if it's a specialized, regionalized program, the student follows the stays in the program. If not, if it's a special program within a school in a regular school setting, then it would follow that it would follow the redistricting guidelines. Ms. Shelley, this is Taj. Um, I don't know if you, if you saw it because there's a lot of comments, uh, but you skipped over the Ms. Walker's question. Did you see that? Ms. Battle Lockhart, in my view, I can just see the first name. Okay, Tanya is the first name. Do you want me to read it for you? Um, if you can see it, yeah, I'm trying to yeah, scroll back through. <laughs> it just says, um, it's, I think she's trying to figure out from the, the alternative map. Um, once I type my address on the alternative map A and click on the three dots, it says view attribute table. The bottom right display shows alternative A middle school zones and displays a school. Is the school shown the school my child will attend? If you minimize or pull out from the map, you can see the color that's that your address is lying within, and then you'll see the school's name and print within that colored area. Okay, I, I didn't know if you saw it, sorry. No, thank you. It, it's sometimes challenging to, to go through and stay on top of the chat, so I appreciate your assistance. So there is some conversation in the chat. Um, there is someone who's concerned about um, the community, um, again, living in that Glen Eagles neighborhood, and I believe um, some individuals were maybe told, I don't know if it was by Lennar, um, that the when they bought their homes, they would be zoned for summers. Um, a lot of folks are saying that it's, you know, one of the reasons why they purchased in that particular neighborhood. Um, there's also a comment similar, I think, into that same area um, within the Glen Eagles neighborhood about 2643. Um, this commenter is just sharing that it's a growing middle class African American community and there's concerns over the fact that they're being moved to a different area within the county um, that has higher statistics. Um, in regards to crime and maybe school zones with possible lower test scores and that the comment says it really doesn't make sense geographically. I don't know if someone here wanted to address that. When the committees were looking at the redistricting process in general, they're just simply looking at numbers um, really from the spreadsheets and from the maps um, regarding where the students are currently located. Um, that's the only information really that they have as a committee was just simply the number of students and trying to balance those schools out. I'm sorry, those students out among the schools. Additionally, when it comes to what people may have been told when they bought their house, whether that's through their realtor or their builder, um, you know, if it's an existing home versus a new construction, 
those zones may be what's in place at the time, but zones are subject to change at any time due to factors such as overcrowding or factors such as new schools being built. Thank you both. There is a comment in here from a parent who um, shares that she did complete the school change request process. I believe it was for her child who attends Benjamin Stoddard to attend Milton Summers and was told by a staff member at Milton Summers that um, there was some overcrowding there. I believe um, on the parents tab on the school system website is where you can find um, the language in regards to the school change request process um, as well as the application and I think the application does indicate um, a enrollment review of the school in which the parent is requesting the child um, be transferred to if I'm speaking correctly. Again, I'm scrolling through the chat to see. Um, we address the special education program question. So there is a question in here in regards to um, what is being done to help with the concerning um, criminal activity in the Stoddard area. Um, last year, there were some incidents um, in the community. And it's concerning for parents whose children are now being moved to this particular school. So let me let me tackle that because I think one of the things that we have monitored for for a while now is the communities and the commu and the schools are part of the communities. Uh, this year we have not seen any incidents come into the school environment. Actually, uh, the opposite, and we have been uh, working with community members in and around Stoddard um, and supporting the staff and the principal, uh, but we have not seen any incidents that have come into the community uh, regarding student safety. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. There's a question in the chat. Are there any plans for when middle school nine will open or start construction? Middle School 9 is currently in our capital improvement program, and we are asking for the state to start the planning process with us. But there are a number of other projects in front of it, including money that is still owed, significant amount of money that is still owed to Charles County from the state on Eve Attorney that just opened this summer. Um, so we have a number of projects in our line, but it is in there. Uh, right now, we have it tentatively, tentatively that it could open for school year 26, but a lot of things could change if funding is not adequate in the next coming years. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Um, there's a question in the chat. Why aren't any modifications being considered? Is it doesn't make sense that surrounding neighborhoods are still zoned for summers, but this individual commenter's neighborhood? Um, they're just sharing that it seems that they're individual community um, is being targeted and there's just frustration about their children um, being moved to another side of town where they don't live. I'm scrolling through the question. There is a few other comments of in folks who um, live in the um, identified Quailwood and Jamestown community for staff and um, others to come and visit the area. There's concern over double buses happening. Um, there's a commenter saying that there's double buses in Glen Eagles and that there's thoughts that the same double busing would happen in the Jamestown mm -hmm. Quill Wood neighborhood. Yeah, there currently is double busing in the um, Glen Eagles area and that was a short short-term fix as they presented the uh, moratorium. So we do go in there and we double bus um, because of the um, UNOs. Um, double busing wouldn't take place in Quailwood and Jamestown because we wouldn't be stopping at the same stop, just getting different um, grade level of students. But there would be, you know, there would be a proximity of course because they are so close together. Thank you, Mr. Snow. There's a question in regards to, since the redistricting 
um, process is relieving classroom size. Is there an ideal class size, i.e. how many kids per class that um, you are trying to achieve? The state rated capacities are based on 25 students per class. However, most of the classes are built to handle more than that number of students. So the state rated capacities, again, are based on 25 students per classroom. That does not include special ed classrooms. They are at much lower numbers. And I do want to clarify that our class guidelines are guidelines also depending on um, the numbers of students that we see. And uh, as we project moving forward and as we look at capacity within buildings and make the decisions of how to maximize the use of our buildings, we're looking holistically also at the state rate of capacity in classrooms, as well as the ever-changing learning spaces that we have and the way we use space for classrooms uh, moving forward. So it's a, we have a, some guidelines um, for classes, specifically um, at the lower grades, but we do have a range. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. There's a question um, regarding double busing. If you allow current seventh graders to finish their eighth grade year at their current school, could we offer the option with the caveat that the parent must provide their own transportation? That would be something that the superintendent um, could make a decision upon. I don't believe that that's been past practice. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Snow or Mr. Andritz, do we have any, can we share with our attendees how the committee um, was formed? Someone is asking about how many La Plata residents were on the committee compared to Waldorf residents. Sure, I can talk about that. Um, as we mentioned, every school was asked for names to volunteer to participate in the redistricting process. Those names were ultimately sent to the principal and if there was more than one name, they did a random draw to pick a name. And those names were forwarded to the board for consideration. All of the names were then drawn out of a hat. So you had all um, 22 elementary schools, at least one name. You had one name from each of those in a hat and you had two drawn. You had all seven high schools and one name drawn. And then you had one name drawn from each of the eight existing middle schools. Additionally, the community members at large could then put in a name. They could send something to the board to say, hey, we'd like to participate. A community at large member is someone who does not have students in the school system. So they were able to put their name in a hat and have their name drawn as well. It is intended to be a completely random draw, but also representative of anywhere across the town. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. This question is in regards to the redistricting policy. Um, there's another commenter on here that has children who were redistricted at the elementary school level. And this individual is asking if they are exempt. Um, they're saying they, their children were redistricted um, in the elementary school process. And now again, through this process, are they exempt from this redistricting effort? The comment says within three years. Unfortunately, it is within three years at a particular school level. So unfortunately, if their student was impacted elementary, they would not be um, exempted from this redistricting because this, again, is middle school. Charles County Public Schools have not done middle school redistricting since 2011. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. There's another comment in regards to um, the geographical sense is non-existent with Quailwood being less than two miles from Summers, but those families are being redistricted to make room for students further away. That's just a comment. An individual is asking that the, um, I think the committee numbers to applications, comparing those numbers of applications to the committee, committee and it seems that the changes heavily benefit the Waldorf area. Um, this individual, they're in Glen Eagle South. Why isn't there any movement for the homes behind our neighborhood? We're the only neighborhood in Glen Eagle South that keeps getting switched from elementary and middle school, but there seems to be a safe zone for homes that are further out that have to pass our neighborhood to get to Milton Summers. Thank you, 
There's another comment in the chat in Can regards I jump to in for a second. Oh yeah, sorry, Mr. Andrews. So part of the process that we've talked about with the redistricting committees is they work independently. There's two groups. They work independently and they look at the zones. And so they start from the outer edges of the existing zones and start to peel away blocks, move them from one school to the next. And it's it's a balancing act to determine what gets them closest to those targeted enrollments. They then also ask questions about, you know, is this neighborhood connected to this neighborhood? Is that an issue? Are these walkers? Uh, is there an issue with how this could be, you know, these students could be transferred? All of that is done by those committees independently for them to develop their proposal. So they can look at any neighborhood. They can look at Glen Eagles. They look at Fieldside. They can look at Sheffield. They can look at Quailwood. They can look at Jamestown. They can look at Bannister, Hampshire, Dorchester, all of those things and look at how they want to move those pieces around. But ultimately, it is up to the committees what they determine as their proposal that gets put forward. And those two proposals are Proposal A and Proposal B, which the better of the two from the uh, comments that we have made in the presentation were the one that was suggested by the superintendent as Proposal A. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. There is another comment in the chat. Um, this person is just um, emphasizing that we're only into the first couple of weeks of the school year. Um, there's someone else who is discussing or has commented how many of the panelists would send their children to a specific school, um, that being Stoddard in regards to performance and safety standard. Um, the same individual is also commenting that there have been um, incidents already at the school this year in regards to um, possible fights among students and that parents are concerned about that. Um, there is a question about middle school nine. Um, when will the charter school be opening? And if we know of a location, I believe that information may be on the board's October um, 12th board meeting agenda. Is that correct, Superintendent Navarro? That's correct. That is coming forward to the board for a decision. Yes. But I think there were two questions in that question, Shelley. There was a question about middle school number nine's timetable and the mm -hmm. charter, unless I heard incorrectly. And those are two different things. Correct. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, middle School 9, as was mentioned, is in our current capital improvements program that's being submitted to the state in the beginning of October. It is asking for the first steps of planning approval process, but there are a number of projects in front of it, so the timetable could change, but the current timetable would have that opening for school year 26. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. There's an individual saying that there has also been incidents at Summers um, and there has been no communication sent home to families. A uh, commenter is sharing that um, Stoddard already has many classes at 30 plus students. Uh, why can't students already at Milton Summers from Glen Eagles South stay there and start the redistricting to Stoddart from next school year with the incoming sixth graders? I don't know if that's been addressed this evening. So part of that issue is the impact that it doesn't provide the relief that's needed. Uh, as you look back at the quick reference chart that was in the PowerPoint, you'll see from the 2019 enrollments, there are a number of middle schools that are over capacity that need rebalancing and only moving sixth graders doesn't provide the relief as well as the issues of double busing that Mr. Snow mentioned that would have to happen all over the county. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. There's an additional comment in here in just regards to that. Um, there's a lot of comments here in regards to um, individuals who live in the Glen Eagle South that are against this change. Um, there should be a modification considered. So there's a question in regards to the re redistricting committee and why we would include um, people on those committees that don't have students. This is, it's not necessarily a concern for them um, and it's not a value to them. 
it helps to keep them as an objective participant. If they don't have student or skin in the game, they can be more objective. There's a question. My child goes to Milton Summers. Will this affect him because he walks to school? I'm going to refer that parent to the interactive map and I can share it again in the chat in a few minutes. Um, I believe you can enter in your address and see what zone that would put your child in. Is that correct, Mr. Andritz? That is correct. But also, if you refer to the guidelines, if students are in the walking zone, the walking zones were areas that were committees were told you do not change from one school to the next. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. There's a question in regards to the exemption of redistricting. Does the three year same level exemption apply on a per student basis or per family? If the redistricting happens again for middle school nine in five years, this family's younger child would be affected. We could potentially attend three different CCPS middle schools between our two children on top of two different elementary schools. The way I understand that is that it's per child, unless that's incorrect. I would just say, based on the current policy, the change impacts everyone based on the date. So that is a potential situation that could exist for that family uh, in the future. But those are things that are important to hear about because the board and the superintendent need to hear those and think about those for potential considerations if their policy changes it. Thank you. There's a question or, or a comment with a question. Um, there's been so much transition for your children in the last few years, and so much that has occurred with COVID-19. Could this transition, meaning the middle school redistricting um, process, begin in school year 2023-2024? As was mentioned, the board has the opportunity to make changes to the proposal. However, the problems with not making a change now are the expanded capacity at Stoddard is not being fully utilized. So we're not maximizing usage of the space as this new $8 million building is, is ready for occupancy. But additionally, we're not providing the relief to the existing schools that are overcrowded. And you can refer back to that quick reference chart to see which schools So there's a, a few individuals in here with comments about the Quailwood Jamestown areas. How many of the panelists made recommendations that would directly affect their children? Um, they're sharing that to them that this part of the process doesn't make sense. Um, there's another question. What is the maximum amount of students per class before a new teacher and class will be formed under this redistricting plan? There's another question. Was the committee given any parameters, bus time, grade level of students, other than numbers? The two proposals are nearly identical. Did the committee do any field work and look at the actual neighborhoods that they are redistricting? It seems very numbers oriented and not people oriented. People bought homes based on schools, but all I hear is numbers relief and overcrowding. The committee members themselves did not go out um, and examine physically neighborhoods, streets, or anything of that nature. Uh, we did have interactive maps, Google Maps, Google Earth that they were utilizing um, to look at different areas across the county. So we were providing them information with bus, bus times and things of that nature as they had questions uh, for both committees. Additionally, they do have boots on the ground, not by the committee members, but by staff from the Transportation Department, from Planning Construction, from Charles County Government Planning Growth Management who deals with development projects, and from the Town of Plato planners that deal with development. So those folks are understanding of what the neighborhoods are. The numbers factor is one of the only ways we're able to keep it objective so that the committee members aren't focusing on uh, this particular child or that particular family. When it's done, it's just numbers. It's a way that they can be objective. Thank you both. Uh, will the redistricting be phased in or will my current sixth graders have to change schools? When the redistricting becomes effective for school year 22-23, everyone will move. If they're a middle school student now, 
Uh, if they're an eighth grader now, they'll be rising to ninth grade next year and they wouldn't be impacted. If they're a current sixth or seventh grader this year, they would be impacted. Or if they're a fifth grader moving to sixth grade next year. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Is there any way to change the decision to go with proposal A? A commenter is sharing as we go through the comments and the questions, it seems that most of the parents in Glen Eagles would like for their children to be able to attend school at Milton Summers and not be moved to Stoddart or have their child moved again. Um, would they be able to start a petition and are, are there any alternatives? As Mr. Andrews mentioned before, uh, the ability to uh, make changes or modifications rests in the superintendent's hands and also the board. Um, they've chosen to select um, plan A. Superintendent has recommended that, but modifications can be made by the superintendent or the board, as Steve Andrews had mentioned. So I just want to add some context to this, which I think is important. Um, the committees are following the established uh, board policy on how to make decisions and what data to utilize make recommendations by which um, I made a recommendation to the board and I think the, 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 that aligns to the utilization of the facilities and following the current guidelines. The process that we're following tonight is also an ability for the board to hear community concerns uh, with the proposed recommendation from me to them as well as queue up any questions um, regarding how decisions were made um, regarding areas of the county and specific sections and neighborhoods. Um, so to the comment that you read, Shelley, um, this is part of the feedback. This is part of the process and board members um, have to hear the public's comment to make a decision about whether they want to adopt the superintendent's recommendation or they would like to make adjustments based on the community feedback. So I do wanna point out that this is part of the process and we do appreciate and are capturing all of your comments as you are uh, typing them in and bringing them up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Um, a commenter is saying um, objective isn't always the best way to look at the effect on families and their lives. Maybe it's time to take a subjective look at the um, objective results and see if the proposals make sense. Um, maybe this person recommends maybe a new committee should be made to perform this review. So somebody's asking with new neighborhoods popping up from Billingsley to La Plata, have you taken into account class sizes going over 25 students? per class within the next three to five years. As was mentioned, most of the schools have classrooms that are set up that can handle, that are built large enough to handle more students. 25 is just the target number when you calculate the state rating capacity. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Uh, somebody is recommending we build more schools. Um, I believe this question may have already been asked. What's the maximum amount of students per class before a new teacher and a new class would be formed under this redistricting plan? There's a question. I don't think I heard the answer to targeted bus time. What is the amount of time we expect kids to be bused to a new school? 20 minutes, 30 minutes? So our bus times, we typically like, don't like to go over 45 minutes to an hour in the longest day. We, what we did um, with some of the areas here, for example, the Quailwood area, uh, we took a bus over and actually did a timed running from Quailwood to Pickawaxen, uh, just to get an idea of what that time frame would look like. So the transportation office did take some um, initiative and try to get some times uh, for, for things like that. But I would say 45 minutes. Uh, would be to an hour would be the maximum we'd like to have students, you know, at any time on a bus. And that would be for our most uh, rural areas where we have to go a, a good distance between student pickups where the students have to ride on a bus for an extended period of time. Thank you, Mr. Snow. There's a few comments in the chat about um, how the process takes a look at numbers. Uh, there's a reference to the numbers game approach by the committee. Um, there's an individual who's concerned that we're looking at students as numbers rather than individuals. 
and Shelley, as uh, Dr. Navarro mentioned earlier, that is part of the way the process is established. So the comments uh, are important for everyone to hear, but we are following the established process. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Um, someone is saying they highly recommended option C, which includes true multi-year phases, children already in schools or grandfathered in until they move on to high school, um, and children graduating elementary are um, vectored to the new redistricted middle schools along with new residents. Middle school is not so long for this not to happen, so why is this not an option? There's an individual who's asking for um, maybe changes to the process. Shelly, can I go back to your last comment? One sure. of the issues with any of those phased in approaches is that it doesn't provide the relief that is needed at the schools that are overcrowded. Um, additionally, I think as Mr. Snow has mentioned before, you run into the issues of double busing, which would be amplified if you're doing that across the county, not just where there have been discussions as it exists now based on the moratorium in Glen Eagles. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Um, I'm thinking that I gathered all of the comments. Um, there are individuals who, again, someone is asking, could parents have the option to be responsible for their children's transportation if they want to keep them in the current school? There's another parent who's saying they live in the Autumn Woods, um, which is off of Lofton Hill Road. They're located in the bottom right corner of zone 271. They're the only street in our zone that is slated to go to Pickawaxen. They built their home in the neighborhood to be close to school. They're referencing Milton Summers is 3.7 miles. Pickawaxen is 16 miles. A one hour bus ride is not acceptable when there is a school seven minutes away. There's another commenter who has concerns about um, the growth in class sizes. They're concerned about the impact it's going to have on the learning process. The more students a teacher has, the less focus is going to be on education. Uh, this person also references mental health of children not being able to be with people they know and having to make new friends and that this would be hard for some students. Shelly, you did make a comment uh, earlier too about building more schools. I would like to make a, a little bit of a response to that. Um, Charles County Public Schools, just like all the jurisdictions in the state of Maryland, are bound to the process that involves state funding and local funding to building schools. And there's a process at which you have to justify that school. And that requires that a majority of the students that would fill that school would already be in place. So in essence, overcrowding has to exist in order to justify through the state process new schools. We continually work through those processes with the state and with our local uh, county government partners to justify schools, to support them, to ask for them earlier. But those critical criteria, as well as needing to be able to fill those schools to their capacities within seven years are critical components that are utilized by the state when determining whether or not you can get justification to support a new school. The next part then is the amount of money that's available to build the new schools. Uh, the state is working on a current 10 year average number which sees Charles County getting about $10 million a year in capital funding. And as was mentioned earlier, you look at Benjamin Stoddard's project cost at $48 million and seeing that the state is responsible for 65% of the bricks and mortar the math works that it doesn't go very far to building a lot of buildings. Uh, even if we wanted to get ahead of things, there needs to be a significant amount of funding available to do that that doesn't exist from the state. Thank you, Mr. Andritz. Mr. Andritz, is there an expectation when a, when a remodel takes place, uh, such as Stoddard, that the state, with the funds that you've received, that that building become full in, in a certain amount of time? Yes. So I think that's also an issue whenever you're doing a construction project like this, as you're receiving funding, I think there's an expectation through the state that they're gonna be utilizing that space to the maximum. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Um, are there plans, oh, Ms. Battle Lockhart, you have a question? 
Um, I, I, I'm glad that um, Mr. Andrews mentioned the process because a couple, um, I saw a couple of comments about the process, change the process or change the leadership. Um, um, fortunately, to piggyback on what Mr. Andrews said is um, the state is involved in the process as well. So um, it's kind of hard to change the process when we're being dictated by the state of what we're supposed to do. Um, if we had the opportunity to build more schools, definitely that would be an option. Um, as we all see that Milton Summers is a very popular school. Everybody wants to stay there. And that's one of the schools that's overcrowded. So that, that's why in this process, we have to take everything in consideration. So definitely we hear you. <laughs> I just wanted to say, because a lot of people are saying, are you listening to our company? We're definitely listening. Yes, we take those into consideration. So, I, you know, I know we have a lot of meetings and people say that we don't have an opportunity to speak back to you. So I just wanted to say that, I mean, we're listening and yes, we do take your comments. But um, if it was as easy as changing the process, definitely we would take advantage of that. But unfortunately, Steve um, and his team works extremely hard <laughs> to try to ensure that we um, make the best decisions with what we have to work with. Um, unfortunately, when we're going through the process to shift um, students, um, it's, it's a hard decision to make, um, to make, fit the needs of what we have to, in the county to work with without new schools. So definitely, um, we hear you. I just want to put that out there, and I'm glad that Steve mentioned about the process because um, we don't control the process, unfortunately. We try to make the best out of the process that we have to work with. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Battle Lockhart. There's another question in the chat. Are there plans for the number of students that are moving further with the nationwide bus shortage? The students that are moving further out from their associated school, um, there's no consideration for the bus shortage. Those students, the students are being transported by a bus. Uh, regardless of what school they go to. As we mentioned earlier, there's no one that's in a current walk zone um, that would be impacted by the redistricting. Uh, therefore, all the students um, that would have previously been on a bus will now be on a bus. That bus would just be going to a different location and different locations throughout the county as some blocks have shifted at all the schools. Thank you, Mr. Snow. There's a question, who do we have to change, who do we have to contact to change the process? If there was a question about changing the redistricting process and how that functions, uh, those are things that ultimately come through the board and through the superintendent. And uh, one of the perfect examples that I can give for that is there, as mentioned during the timeline, there's a public information meeting that's done before the redistricting committee does any of its work. That is something that hadn't happened um, probably about not eight or nine years ago. There was not that process. It did not give the public any opportunity to voice concerns or comments or questions or things that they wanted the committees to look at. So things like that come out of comments like this about process. So there are ways in which the folks that are listening, the board and the superintendent, can take this information and look at those policies and determine whether changes needed may be made or what is appropriate. Hey, Steve, this is Mike. I, I'm looking at the chat. I appreciate your response. I think there's there's two different things that you people were talking about the state. So financially, right? We we as most districts, most counties, we need money from the state. Um, you know, but but to be clear, the process for redistricting is, as you said, at a local level. At, at the board level, the process for having meetings, the process for getting two separate committees together, that 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 all lies within us um, as a county. Um, as far as getting funding, that that is what we need to um, collaborate with the state and, quite frankly, county officials too, because it's the county officials that have the ultimate decision on growth. Um, so I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Sure, and I'll add I'll add a little bit to that. Um, if the state were not to participate, it becomes a full local responsibility to build a school. That is an option. Um, there are there are work groups that are working right now jointly with staff from 
uh, the school system and from county government planning growth management looking at uh, as well as the folks from their finance area at opportunities for funding and how those might increase to offer us uh, opportunities to do other things, possibly schools that are not involving the state, uh, but those are just beginning their process. But again, the, the process as we have it and where we are requires and depends on the state money in order to make those major school renovations or new schools a reality. Ms. Donna Lockhart, do you have a question or a comment? Just another comment. I just wanted to um, uh, com there, I saw a comment about um, what do we do um, as boards to support and make change. One of the things that we've been doing for the past, how long, I believe, a little a year now, um, is having these conversations and showing up at the county commissioners talking about seat allocations about all the new building, all the new buildings that's in subdivisions that's coming in the county which affects this whole process, which is why this is happening. So um, I'm not sure if a lot of people have participated, but their, um, their meetings are recorded just like ours are. So there's been times where we as a group have gone and publicly had those conversations with the county commissioners to bring forth the concerns of so many houses being built. And because of the fact we just can't build a school, that that's a concern. And we bring those concerns to them so we can try to, our best to try to see if they can work with us collaboratively to control those numbers as much as we can. So we're constantly um, having these conversations to see what we can do to support in <laughs> um, limiting as much overcrowding within our community um, that affects our school system as possible. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Mr. Hancock, do you have a question? Sorry, I'm on my cell phone, my laptop. I, not a question, just a comment to um, address some of the things I saw in the chat about the Jamestown Quailwood area. And um, I might be out of bounds in, in saying this, but um, I I had mentioned this to Dr. Navarro. Um, I am in full support of keeping Jamestown and Quailwood together moving forward. Um, I know it's two separate neighborhoods, and the Jamestown is a younger neighborhood, but I have been back to the Jamestown neighborhood and when you come in off of Oriole Lane, you can take that same drive all the way into Quailwood. And if somebody didn't tell me that neighborhood was Jamestown, um, I would never know that it wasn't a part of Quailwood. Um, and part of this ties into another concern that I have. Um, we're moving um, Pickle Waxen, and we haven't heard a lot of people from the extreme southern end of, of the county, but Pickle Waxen is about to jump by 125%. So it's about 100 students. And... Um, um, I see that Quailwood is being zoned for Pickle Waxen, but Jamestown is remaining in summers, I believe, according to the interactive map. So a question I have, I, in my opinion, that's just far too many students to be moved to Pickle Waxen. Do we know the exact number of students that the Quailwood neighborhood itself is going to uh, produce for Pickle Waxen? Is there any way that we can that, that we can leave Quailwood zoned with Jamestown just so that Pickle Waxen's numbers do not jump so drastic thank you if anybody steve or if anybody could answer that i don't have those numbers off the top of my head but we could easily get them from the interactive map and provide that to the board as they discuss it in the october meeting if that is something that they'd like to discuss it's a request i think we just need to make sure we note it and we um, put it in with all the public comment um, because it's a request from a board member so it should be public to the comment to view as well thank you steve so in looking at the chat dr navarro um it looks as if um there's a few more comments in here in regards to i think the glen eagles um someone is saying it's not that milton summers is where everyone wants to be it just makes sense um, geographically for parents um, there's concerns about um, if schools are overcrowded then why are we students being moved in when others are being moved out the comment is it seems counterproductive there's a couple questions in here about the process i think that um, that's been addressed um miss battle lockhart clarified um, I don't know that I see any other comments. I did put a, a note in the chat area that if a comment was missed or a question was skipped, to please post it. 
I don't see anything new coming through. Great, thank you, Shelley. Uh, and thank you to the community. Like I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this meeting, we are um, taking all of the comments and going through them. Uh, and this information is important. Uh, there is one board follow-up um, because um, from uh, Mr. Hancock that we will make sure that we also follow up on and provide not just to the board members, but to the public, the response to his question this evening um, so that we have that information available. Um, thank you to staff, to both uh, Mr. Snow and Mr. Andritz uh, for answering a lot of questions. Uh, these are questions to be expected from communities as we make changes. I mean, I think this is important to note we should expect communities to ask questions of us as we make decisions because this is about their, their kids um, and we need to make the best decision possible and we need to look and relook at all of the data that we have to, um, to drive those decisions. So for those of you who came this evening, thank you for um, being with us and asking your questions. It's very important for us to know how the community is reacting um, to the difficult um, decisions that we have to make to maximize the use of our facilities, to maximize the resources that we have to build new facilities moving forward. Um, and um, there was just a quick question that I just saw in the chat. Um, we are making all of these, um, the, the chat that happened at all of our meetings available on our website. And uh, thank you, Shelley, you just responded to that question. So with that, Ms. Wilson, I'll turn it over to you, uh, unless there's any other board member questions. But thank you again, Dr. Navarro, and to your staff for all of your hard work. And I echo your comments. I, I want to also give a special thank you to the committee members for their hard work. Um, the comments tonight and the questions are very useful. Um, and I will want to reassure the public, we appreciate this participation. We need, we need your support, we need your input, we value your support and your input. And all of this is going to be taken very, very serious, seriously. Redistributing is never an easy process. It is, it's very challenging, it affects many homes, and it affects our students. And, and I can assure you that we will carefully evaluate the option and possible alternatives but we will always keep the best interests of our students in mind. So thank you again to the public for joining us tonight. Um, are, are there any other questions or comments from our fellow board members before we close for the evening? No, I just want to say thank you. Those are a lot of great um, information that we definitely can use. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the outcome can be. So Dr. Barra, Go ahead, uh, Mrs. McGraw. Can't, can't hear you. I just wanted to say thank you to the community as well, because tonight is the first night of all four of our town halls that we have had such a nice showing. So it really gives us information to consider and weigh before we make our decision. So uh, I appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. This concludes uh, this forum and thank you again for all that joined us tonight. This was very useful and very helpful. Thank you again and good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.